Welcome everyone to the last panel of the Founders of the Future Forum at the London Tech Week. I'm your host, Pierre Nilohungua, co-founder of Founders of the Future. We just had an incredible afternoon. Uh, you just heard from Eric Schmidt, former CEO and chairman of uh, Google. And now we're about to finish strong. Indeed, like this uh, subject uh, is dear to our heart as our belief is that tech founders are the new breed of elite athlete because they have to perform um, every day at the best of their abilities, but don't have, have exactly the same lifestyle as athletes. So we're going to have this panel, mental health and human performance, tech founders versus elite athletes. And I'm going to end it over now to Chase Jarvis, co-founder of Creative Live, to, uh, run, to kick off and run this panel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pierre. Again, my name is Chase. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, the worldwide audience, whether it's good evening, morning, afternoon for you. Um, I've been lucky enough to be a part of the Founders Forum community since its inception and have spent my life around world-class performers across a huge spectrum of disciplines, which uh, makes me extremely excited for today's conversation. Our panelists are two world-classers in their own right. Uh, our first, Christine Uhurugu an MBE track and field 400 meter Olympic gold medalist and former world champion with team Great Britain. Uh, and Alex too. Alex is the co-founder and CEO of Calm, which is the leading digital health brand for mental fitness, meditation, and sleep. Calm, as you probably know, has grown to somewhere near 100 million downloads, 90-something million downloads, Apple uh, 2017 app of the year, and is the world's first mental health unicorn. Uh, please, wherever you are in the world, tap your desk, raise the roof, uh, give a shout out to our two guests today. And as, uh, as Pierre eloquently introduced, the intensity, the ups and downs, and the constant stress, pressure to perform can make the experience of being a founder, of course, emotionally challenging and physically draining in the same way that elite level athletes who are constantly under that same pressure and need to practice and perform uh, at the highest levels of their ability. So in this panel, I'm going to draw on the parallel between these two and hopefully draw a few insights from our tech founders, uh, as well as a few practical tips. So my first question after welcoming you to the panel um, is for you, Christine. I'm wondering, uh, we have a glamorized in our Western culture, a glamorized view of the life of a elite athlete. I'm hoping you can paint a little, a picture of, uh, of the routine that you all focus on, um, on a day in and day out basis in order to, to perform at the highest level is, is, is life the cakewalk that it's, uh, portrayed in the media or what's it really like on the inside? Unfortunately, no, it's not the cakewalk as portrayed in the media. I think, um, I mean, I understand, I understand why it's, it seems that way because you see the, the grand performances at the end and nobody ever really wants to see all the hard bits, a starter in the middle. So I completely understand. Um, it's really fun. I remember when I, when I won my Olympic gold uh, in 2008 and people were like, well, so you've won now. Are you just going to go and rest until the next Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> four years old and I said no I actually have to train it's not just a one uh, one opportunity you turn up perform and then you disappear under a hole for for four years um but usually when you're working uh, towards an Olympic cycle it, it is four years of graft um before I was able to win my silver in London I had four years of ups and downs and um injuries and all sorts but generally speaking um the journey of a sports person is not glamorous it's difficult it's very lonely it's um you're for, for me in my event we're constantly pushing ourselves every day you're, you're hurting every day um i had to have quite a rigorous timetable and you know and it didn't have to be that hard but for me for me to get what i wanted to 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 achieve i had to push myself in a way that 
my competitors were pushing themselves. So um, it's a very difficult life. And I must say, now that I've retired, I'm, I'm happy I'm out of that. <laughs> I'm quite happy I've, I've retired. <laughs> it's very, very difficult. I mean, it was a six day week, twice training twice a day. Um, and it's, it's, it's not a life that people really understand unless, unless they're in it. So a lot of the time, my friends and family didn't quite get what I was doing, but they, they understood I was working hard, but exactly what that entailed was, was very vague to them. And it's almost like, oh yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. But most of the time you didn't feel fine. And, um, but you have to keep pushing on nevertheless, because you have this goal you want to achieve and you almost feel like if you don't push yourself, you're going to be letting yourself down and you, you won't achieve what you set out to achieve. Thank you. Um, in sort of an obvious parallel, I feel um, compelled to hand the mic to Alex Chu now. And Alex, I'm curious what of what Christine just shared do you find directly parallel to uh, to the life of uh, that Christine just shared with us? I think there are tons of parallels. I mean, the the obvious one is that you're kind of you're always training. Um, you know, you're kind of always learning every single day. You're in the you're in the arena, uh, even though it's different. You know, I mean, in today's age, it's sitting in front of a computer doing Zoom calls all day. But you know otherwise being in an office and like the office is almost like the sports arena and you do have to kind of perform at your best. And, and particularly as a leader or as a founder, you know, you have to um, always put on, you know, the, the best possible performance, if you like. And sometimes that can be really tough, right? Because we all have good days and bad days. Um, and I'm sure it's the same for elite athletes. You know, sometimes you're just not performing as well, but you still need to get that, that session done or that day done. And, um, so I think it's it's very very much parallel. We not, might not have you know um, specific like competition moments, but um, if if there was like moments to pick that were um, parallels, maybe like fundraising, going through that like intense fundraising process, uh, you know, multiple weeks or months where you're just sort of working twenty four seven to try and raise money for your company. That might be the equivalent of like the Olympics or something. Um, but yeah, there are lots of parallels. You know, I think the the obviously the, the kind of like work that you do is, is different, but um, you've got to stay sharp mentally. I think the biggest challenge for the founders of companies is is just like the emotional roller coaster. Um, and I, I don't know if that's the same for Christine and for other elite athletes, but you know, it, it's like in the same day you can feel like you're on top of the world, and also like the world is caving in and it can change on a dime. You know, so definitely requires resilience emotionally. Um, and part of building that resilience is, you know, obviously things like meditation, eating well, getting physical exercise, but um, yeah, it's not for the faint hearted. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you for, for helping us uh, really um, solidify the narrative of the two different personas, but sort of one um, similar path that you've got to be on with respect to performance. And to follow that thread just a little bit further, um, Christine, the 400 meter <laughs> race is probably the most painful race in the Olympic. It's like you're sprinting, but you're not sprinting for a hundred meters. And um, so I, I know it to be a painful one. And it, in a double world champion, an Olympic champion, a Commonwealth champion, silver medalist, gold medalist. I mean, this obviously doesn't come with a lot of work, but one of the things that a distinction I'm hoping you can ha help uh, us understand is so much of it is physical. And I believe that is where most of our culture places the emphasis. I'm hoping you can paint a little bit of a picture on the mental side of performance. And, and is it, is it true that, that, you know, physically the gifts between first and third place are very, very similar. And, and what role does specifically the mental strength, fitness, flexibility, what role does the mental part play in the success of elite athletes? I would say that absolutely the mental is probably the, the hardest part to master, but it's the, the strongest tool you have in your toolbox. I always tell people that going into an Olympic final, going into a championship, I was never the fastest on paper, but I understood myself well enough 
um, to put myself in a position to be able to go out and challenge and be willing to go and, and, and try out and push myself as hard as I could. So, and my coach always said that was because he always said, Chris, you know, you're tough. I can, he always tell me that he could coach me to 300 meters, but the last hundred is just a battle of the minds. That's the last hundred. He goes, Chris, I know you can do it. I know you fight. I know you've got it in you. So um, that's probably why 400 is one of the hardest because it's very, very hard to coach. It's, you, can be phys- you, know, you can be physically very, very adaptable to 400, but it's, you're constantly in a, in a mind flux. You know, am I going off too hard? Have I gone off not hard enough? Am, am I, are they going to catch me? Am I, you're constantly you know, in, 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 in doubt at times, but I think I was able to... Um, do well because I've managed to harness the power of the mind. And I definitely think that plays a much, much bigger role than athletes probably like to give it uh, credit. I, I do think because I was mentally a lot sharper when I mean sharper, I don't mean in terms of, um, um, I'm not talking like book intelligence. I just mean um, sharper in terms of, I understood myself very, very well. I understood the 400 very, very well. And I understood the weaknesses and strengths of my competitors and how I was going to almost maneuver myself um, around them to, to, you know, to do well. Um, but as I said, uh, just opening this, uh, the answer to your question, this is, as I said earlier, um, I was never the strongest on paper. I wasn't, I wasn't the quickest, but I, I think I had something else, um, which was my mental application, which is probably um, the, the strongest skill set that I, that I had. Well, just a quick follow up question before we go back to Alex and the parallels are not, not hard to see. I'm curious what your training, what your mental training looked like. I think, again, we're all, we can picture our, we can picture the life of this, you know, elite athlete like yourself, but I don't think we have a good picture of the mental work that you do. And so I'm curious if you could build out that narrative for us, what, what sort of um, attributes did you train for? How did you train? What was important? What was something that you steered clear of? Give us a little picture there. I think when I first started running 400, I was very much um, a novice as, as you would be, but I was very scared of the event. I was scared. Um, And that's, fear of running 400 really did influence how I ran. And it wasn't just the running itself. Racing became really troublesome and difficult. I didn't want to race. I'd train all day, but when it came to racing, I didn't want to do it because I was scared of competing. So my first foray into sports psychology was the one that kind of started teaching me how to stop fearing my event. And um, I remember at the time, it was almost delving into what the issues I had about, you know, about the 400. And I think it was at that point, I really started to learn to be very honest with myself. So um, I'd have to ask myself, you know, difficult questions such as, um, you know, you just admitting to yourself that you're scared. And if you're scared of so-and-so person who's run five seconds quicker, or you're scared about doing badly, so you might, um, you know, be at the wrath of your coaches, that kind of thing. It had to, it allowed me at that early moment of my career to really start understanding myself and what it was that, or what the messages were that I was telling myself. Um, so I think that was a very good early lesson for me. And it was a really good, I suppose, a really good, um, I suppose, uh, partnership I had with my sports psychologist and that she really got me to be very, very honest. Um, very, very honest when I didn't do so well and not make excuses, um, not blame my coach, not blame the weather, not blame the wind, <laughs> not blame the block slipping. It was it was about being able to take responsibility of my actions and if I didn't train very well and all those kind of things. So that's kind of how it started initially. Um, as I progressed through the sport, it was a case of, I suppose, me being very confident in my skill. I was, as I said, I was never the quickest, but it was almost... Um, we were almost kind of being able to create a really, really powerful mindset, even though so-and-so was, you know, world lead or already broken records, but it was being able to develop the confidence in myself. So that was, I probably think that was probably the, the next lesson that I had was being able to accept myself as a 400 meter runner, accept my strengths and not be so hard on myself when it came to my weaknesses. Um, so that probably was the, the middle stage. I think probably the, the bit that people might understand a 
probably more, more might appreciate a little bit more was um, when I was able to run a British record in 2013. And um, that was a year, maybe, maybe not a year, maybe uh, just maybe call it like seven, eight months of just pure visualization where I just, you know, we worked on it every week, every week we were visualizing a British record. So I was running in my mind, I was running a British record from like three, four months out because that's the goal we decided we were gonna, we were gonna work on. I, you know, I'd had a silver medal the year before that in 2012. And we really did believe that the record was probably, that would be my best shot. I was getting older in my years. I wasn't quite sure how many more world well, champs I would, my body would, 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 you know, would hold up for. So we thought, you know, let's, after the Olympic games, while you're still got your running legs on, let's try and use this opportunity to go for the record. So we were planning this from like October up from before the champs. And it was a constant visualization, so much so that when I actually did get to the world champs um, in Moscow 2013, I'd felt like I'd already been there. It was so familiar to me and it wasn't scary. So usually the angst I get competing wasn't there. So I think what I've just almost just highlighted is just kind of different phases of um, my kind of sports psychology and how it evolved to adapt to what I felt I needed at the time. As, as you grow and evolve in your career, you do need different things. Um, and, um, and also my, my relationship with my uh, psychologist changed as well because I was, I, was, I was a different person. I wasn't that youngster who was scared of the 400. I was an older person who was very, very good at their job and we're trying to figure out how to make really, really, you know, really, really subtle gains um, um, against a competitive field who knew exactly what my strengths and weaknesses were. So um, it was, I suppose, uh, being able to adapt and develop. And I think that worked well because, again, I was very, very honest with myself, what I needed, where I wasn't so good. And I was very honest with my um, with my team. So sometimes I think I have one end of the stick and my coach will be like, no, that is completely wrong. <laughs> Stop lying. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's really how it worked. But I think it was purely down to just being able to have that capacity to have a dialogue with other people to really kind of keep you, uh, keep you clear about what your goals and your aims were. Well, I heard so many, uh, amazing sort of anchor words in there visualization um mindful awareness um a coach a psychologist uh partners and alex this seems to me to be precisely what you have created with calm uh it, it, as a as a guide as a, a foundation uh how we've heard from christine that you know the foundation of mental attributes are every bit, if not more important than the psychological or uh, than the physical ones. So what did you aim to bring to the world with the development of calm and was any of what Christine's sort of thread, uh, did you have any of those aims in mind when you created it? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing hearing, you know, some of the things Christine's talking about because it's, it's so clearly, you know, what calm's all about, you know, we're trying to bring these tools to the sort of uh, the wider world. And, you know, there's no more important a place to start than your own mind because it dictates everything that happens in your life. You know, all the emotions you feel, the goals, the aspirations, the dreams, um, you know, and so with calm, we really want to help people navigate this kind of busy, stressful, complex world by providing, you know, these different tools. And it's kind of like having a coach, in your pocket, you know, we have these audio programs that, you know, teach meditation, but also a lot of other content. We have masterclasses from leading experts around the world about how to apply mindfulness into your life. Um, and really kind of allows people to sort of train their own mind. They do actually the work, you know, with a, co a great coach will facilitate you doing your own work and will help reveal um, your, your own potential. So we're trying to do that at Calm and, and using the power of mobile and using the power of the internet to reach a, a mass audience. You know, we started very much as like a meditation um, teaching app. You know, meditation is an incredibly powerful uh, skill if you, can, if you can master it. And it is tricky to learn because it's so, it's so against the grain of, um, you know, normal life because we're all so used to doing 
uh, as opposed to just being. And so learning to like find stillness within is, is super valuable, but it can be tricky. And so we try to make it as easy as possible. Um, and in, in more recent years, you know, we started meditation, we've expanded. And so we have, you know, sleep is a big, big part of, of what calm's about now. And there's nothing more important for your mental and physical health than getting a good night's sleep. And I think the world is only just kind of beginning to wake up to that fact where, whereas before, you know, particularly in, you know, the tech world, there's been this sort of reverence for sleeping like only a few hours a night or not sleeping at all. Um, or, you know, just kind of burning the candle at both ends. And I think the realization is for the vast majority of people, you need to get a good night's sleep and that will set you up. And then if you can layer on these other tools like meditation um, and focusing and visualization and coaching and, you know, CBT and lots of other techniques, like you can, you know, really hopefully live a happier, healthier life that allows you to achieve your goals. But yeah, Calm's mission is, is pretty simple. Um, ultimately, we want to help improve the mental fitness, the mental wellness of the world. Um, and yeah, so far, um, you know, it seems to be, seems to be appealing to a lot of people. Yeah. You, you, uh, somewhere in that last response, there was this, you talk about happiness and I think there's a great Marcus Aurelius quote, the happiness of your life depends directly on the quality of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if that's true and, you know, we can actually control our thoughts rather than, you know, that's part of what meditation is or mindfulness is watching, watching thoughts go by. Uh, it's just, it seems more and more obvious to us that the power of our own happiness is within our control rather than externally. And the point that you made, Alex, about sleep is, is incredible. And we have, as the founders culture has been plagued with this hustle, I'll call it hustle porn, where always oh, we send pictures out there in the universe of working 24 seven and what we're coming to find out is of course, hard work is essential, but Christine, tell us uh, a little bit about your recovery um, plan. I know that as you know, nutritionists and, and all the mental coaches that, that I'm curious if, if, you know, we can take some cues from what you've done as a, as a world-class performer around recovery and not just working 24 seven. It's, it's very tempting to overtrain. It's very tempting to feel, oh, I, I feel great. Let me go and do that extra run or let me go and, you know, have an extra <laughs> day of, of, of hard workout. It's very, very tempting. And, and, and I, I, I understand it because I'm one of those people. <laughs> I'm one of those people who always has to do more, is never quite satisfied with any of the work that she's done. Um, and, and it was a very, very tough a uh, very, very tough balance to maintain. I think fortunately for me, um, my coach is the opposite of me. He's very laid back. And I think it was a, the best pairing. <laughs> we were blessed to have each other because I'm just go, 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 go. And he's the one that kind of reigns me in. He, he would one that would say, Chris, you know, you've done two runs, go home. I don't want to see you again until, <laughs> until next week. And I'd listen to him. I really respected that. So I think that's probably what was one of the best ways in which I was able to curb my, um, I was going to say curb my madness. <laughs> I love training. I would train all day if I could, but I, you know, I had somebody who would, he would keep me in line. So that was one way that I, I was able to stop um, and going overboard. Um, another way is just listening to your body. I, I'm, I'm quite um, intuitive um, so I'd always know when I'm not feeling 100%. I always know like instinctively when I'm not feeling okay. And for me, whenever I start getting run down, um, you know, my body would tell me. And um, that's when I know I'm overtraining. So I always had signals and it was being able to, um, you know, be, listen to those signals and understand that it's not 24 hours. It doesn't have to be 24 hours a day of training. That You can get just as much good of resting than you can work in. And most of the time the body actually does like to rest and, and, and sort itself out. So you have, you know, I had physical limitations to my, <laughs> cause <they're> my madness, <laughs> but it really does. It really did seem like a madness. It was just nonstop. If I could train all day, as I said, so I had the, you know, the limitation of my coach and I had my own physical limitations, such as being sick or sometimes you get injured. Um, or other times you just be really tired. And I, and I think also what um, I realized later 
uh, towards the end of my career was sometimes you just suffer from um, mental fatigue. And that's one thing we all, I, 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 I think that's um, kind of can creep up on you so insidiously without you even realizing. And it's just that kind of um, boredom, not caring, not caring about the result. And that's usually because you're tired. Um, I think when you're tired, you generally have a better handle on kind of appraising how things are, are happening around you. Um, and so I think that's usually what happens. I think when you find a lot of athletes are feeling a bit jaded, it's usually because they just need to go away, have a, have a breath fresh of air, you know, uh, you know uh, and, and then come back, come back with a fresher perspective. So that's another reason why recovery was so good because it just allows you to kind of break from your, the loop that you have in your mind and just have a bit of, of clarity. Did I answer your question? I kind of feel like a yeah. 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 Of course, no, of course you have. <laughs> I just the, the role of sleep, I think, is you know, going away and resting and sleeping, like literally physically sleeping, but also just a disconnection with yeah. all of the tools that we're programmed to over index on. Um, and you know, that's a great opportunity to hand the mic back to Alex because Alex, not only are you the founder of the first sort of health unicorn and, and it's focused on all of these attributes that we're talking about, but clearly you yourself in order to create this will have had to, um, reconcile many of the same challenges that Christine has uh, shared with us. And I'm wondering if you can walk us through some of your personal journey uh, and, and how you either leaned into and suffered or combated this sort of hustle, um, hustle porn, as I, I just shared mentality that I think is a, is a myth and, and, and how you managed that. Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, yeah, the hustle porn kind of thing is, it's a little bit dangerous because it, it, it almost um, makes people impatient and like, like building something great takes time. Like it takes many, many years typically. Like we only ever hear about the exceptional cases where someone builds a company and sells it in like 12 months. Mm -hmm. And when you actually dig in, you find out they were actually working on it for four years prior, but the media, the PR spin is really, really good. So I think like people have to realize it does take time, but you, you can be impatient for results on a day-to-day -day basis, but it, you, you don't want to just like spin around and uh, use up energy that isn't actually pushing the business forward. So I think there's a difference between sort of motion and much productivity. And I think like hustle porn sometimes confuses the, the, the two. Um, for me personally, I think what I've learned is the most important thing is just showing up every day, you know, and some days you, you, you're going to be on, on like your A game and you're going to be super sharp and other days, you know, you might not have slept well the night before and like you've got a million emails and you, you're not going to be as sharp, but as, as long as you show up every day, you know, day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out, you, you know, if you're working on something good, like it will carry you through. And it's not always pretty, right? Like I think, you know, we all often hear like the founder stories and entrepreneurial stories, like it was all perfect and, you know, it all went swimmingly and it was all super smooth. And the reality is like, it's, it's tough, you know, it's really hard. Like if, if, if you choose to, try and create a company, it's like a really seriously tough endeavor and you need to find ways to cope with that. And everyone finds different coping strategies. Like for me, it's like meditating every single day, trying to sleep eight to nine hours a night. You know, I, I need a pretty good sleeper. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but at least try. And then, and then realization there is also, like there will be times when you really need to sprint. You know, like I mentioned earlier, like with your fundraising, that can be a super intense kind of moment where you do need to kind of like burn the candle potentially at both ends but not forever. Like you, you shouldn't be in that constant state of burnout. Um, otherwise you'll just be, you know, not productive ultimately. So finding your own personal balance and what works for you is one thing. Um, but yeah, for me personally, meditation, sleep, um, you know, trying to eat well and, you know, getting some time off, like getting disconnecting. It's so easy to stay connected 100% of the time. And I am, I will freely admit like many people, like a bit of a, an addict to, checking social media and checking email at like hours of the day that I probably shouldn't, but um, I, I'm always trying to do better. So. Excellent. Excellent. I want to remind everyone, I've got a, one more follow-up question for you there, Alex, but before we do that in the next minute or so, I would love to answer or have uh, our esteemed panelists here answer a couple questions from the audience. We'll save about five minutes here starting in the next, uh, say, 60 to 90 seconds. So if you've got some, I do see a couple coming in, so I'll be sure to get to those. Um, but just a quick follow-up. Um, again, pulling on the thread that Christine shared 
um, and uh, mapping that to yours. You mentioned that calm has so many different aspects to it, right? It has the um, the meditations and and mindfulness practices and awareness and and specifically um, sleep. Now, have has the product evolved to address? Uh, the needs of your audience or are you programming to health? Are you saying this is what the health experts are saying? So we're going to put more or some combination there. And I'm looking to see if there's some similarities in, in the way that you're expanding the app and what Christine went through as an elite athlete. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of everything, you know, we're, we're looking out outside of, of the company to see what is um, what is working out there, but also looking internally, looking at the data. So, you know, we have millions of users and we can see how people use the app. We can see what they might be interested in. So, you know, we have this product called Sleep Stories where we basically reinvented bedtime stories for, for grown-ups. Oh, there you go. And I've got it right uh, here. You know, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it sounds so simple, but it's been this like phenomenal hit. And now we have hundreds of stories, um, hundreds of millions of listens and people swear by them, like they really, really work. And we just we sort of discovered in the early days of calm that people were using meditations to try and sleep, and there's this big spike in, in in the evening. But meditations aren't necessarily intended to help you sleep, so we kind of thought, what else can we create? And, and sleep stories kind of came out of that. So it's a combination, yeah, of looking looking at the data, looking at what our, our users are, are interested in, but also looking outside and um, using our sort of own imagination of it. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, Nadal has a question and it's right along this uh, line of discussion that we've been pursuing in the last uh, five or six minutes here. The use of mindfulness meditation, and I'll actually add visualization since that's a, a strong component of what Christine talked about. How important are those in um, what he says here in presence in being able to be present in the moment in order to maximize performance. Christine, let's hear from you. Yeah, I, I really did like a lot of what Alex was saying. I think um, I, I would have touched on it in some points, probably not as formally as meditation per se, but I think it's that ability you have to, um, I suppose, stop and just shut down the mind. And um, I've noticed that when I'm in that state, especially in a championship where everything is, happening around you it's busy it's loud it's you know you have people running and doing that or, or not doing well um the ability you have to just quiet that down the mind and allow your um i don't know i suppose allow your instinct to take over is one i think one of my one of my best assets i think i have take you know get taken into a race so um I might not have practiced it formally, but I think it's something that I've learned to understand and realize is actually a really powerful component of my performance, just to be able to quieten down my mind and focus exactly on what I'm there to do. Excellent. Alex, what about you? For uh, What do you recommend out of the Calm app for Nadal's question specifically around how to be more present to maximize performance? Yeah, I think just, you know, learning the basics of meditation, you know, we have, we have a great course in the app that will take you step by step through, through what meditation is. And ultimately it is about bringing your attention to the present moment. And, you know, you might've heard that like the breath can be a great anchor, focus on the breath in and out and you just do it over and over again. You can use other anchors like sound or even, you know, things in your visual field. But um, yeah, I think in, in, in sort of the simplest terms, just learning the basics and you can do that in 10 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be a, huge investment, but it can, can ultimately pay dividends. Yeah. There's this thread in both of your universes where you talked about showing up. Christine talked about training every day for years from a young competitor to a um, later stage where you have some wisdom. And I think this concept of, of regular um, regularly showing up has been uh, a constant. Uh, there's one other question that I want to get to before we're at time and I'd like to hear the answer from both of you. And that is, um, what is the best way to change your sleeping pattern to be an early riser? I don't know if this applies to you, Christine, but uh, I'm, I know it is a, it's part of the dialogue in founder culture, um, getting up early and you know doing all these things. I'm wondering, again, this, the, the question that came in is, what's the best way to change your sleeping pattern to be an early riser? 
Okay. Um, okay. I, I think for me, I, I always started quite early because of, of because of training. So um, I, I think for me, it was the best. <laughs> I think it's a difficult question. Um, I, okay. So what I would do, I just talk about what I would do. And what I would do, I'd always make sure that all my things were packed the night before. I know it sounds very elementary, but just making sure I got my stuff in order. I had my training kit ready. I'd also make sure that I knew exactly what I was going to do as I woke up. So, um, you know, everything was set out, breakfast, leave the house, blah, 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 blah. And that just helps you get organized. Um, no, no, that's beautiful. Routine is a huge part of uh, performance. Yeah. It's being clear. Uh, Alex, what about from you? Are there some specific uh, ways, either through what you've learned in the data from Calm or yourself as a founder, what's the best way to direct your sleeping pattern to, to be more successful early? Mm. Yeah, so I was always historically more of a late riser. So booking really early Zoom calls is a very good forcing function to get up early. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, just I think getting to bed early is the main thing, just getting to that habit. And, you know, I found that like sleeping with a cold temperature has made a huge difference to me. I didn't realize like sleeping in a warm, warm room was so uh, hot room was bad. And, yeah, and then sleep stories in the app. I mean, you know, don't want to sort of harp on too much about them, but they've been a game changer for me personally. So, I, you know, I think that's one of the exciting things with being able to use your own product and um, just having somebody talking in a very calm way that just occupies your own conscious cycles so you're not ruminating on everything that's happened in the day it helps you get to sleep like when you want to get to sleep. I think so many of us, our head hits the pillow and suddenly all of the worries and thoughts of the day rush in. So um, those are a couple for me. Awesome. Thank you. Well, there's so few of us uh, on this call have the opportunity to try out for a, a uh, make a run at a gold medal. So I'll, I'll direct some of the closing comments to the founders out there. Uh, hopefully you've taken a, a away a handful of actionable items here around sleep, meditation, mindfulness, awareness, training, consistency. We heard that from both Alex and Christine, our esteemed panelists. Um, and I would love to um, thank the both of you for sharing a little bit of uh, what has gone into your success and both and, and congratulate you, Nyasha, uh, Nadal, a handful of other folks who have asked questions in the, in the um, comments here. Uh, so I want to take a second, recognize you both and say thank you so much for sharing. Um, and then I would also like to uh close the session and i want to do so by asking you all to turn in to tune in rather for the last session of the founders of the future forum which is closing remarks where the winners of both f factor national finals are going to be announced here very shortly and will start at 7 15 p.m in by my clock here is seven and a half minutes. So uh, be sure to join that. And one more time, just bidding you both farewell and saying thank you for sharing your stories. Christine and Alex, you've been stellar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.